So hello everyone and uh, welcome to, uh, to the webinar. Um, as you know, this webinar is on the IEA Steel Technology Roadmap. Um, this is a, a project that has been ongoing for, for quite some time. It started in the, uh, towards the end of 2017. And uh, as well, Steel, many of you have also been involved uh, throughout the project but <clears throat> by uh, providing expertise and, and knowledge about the, the steel industry. The roadmap was uh, launched on October 8th um, with a webinar and I hope that uh, most of you have been uh, looking at that webinar and also reading the report. Um, this webinar will be a chance to go into much more of the details of the roadmap um, and of course to ask questions. So before we start, let me just remind you that World Steel operates uh, according to the strictest antitrust guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and if you at any point would feel uncomfortable with the, with the discussion, please let us know via the, the chat function. Um, and uh, you can also find all the details about our antitrust guidelines on our website. You have the address there at the, at the bottom. So if we now move into the, the business of today, uh, we will have a presentation uh, from IEA um, and plenty of time for asking questions. Um, the way to ask questions into, uh, is to go to the questions part in the uh, uh, go to webinar control panel. panel. Uh, just to let you know as well that we are recording this webinar um, as of now and until we, we start the question sessions um, mm. towards the, the very end. So I'm happy to uh, let you know that we have the experts uh, for, on the roadmap uh, from the IEA with us today. And that is Araceli fernandez Palace, who is the demand side um, lead at the Energy Technology uh, Policy Division at the IEA. Uh, she's joined by Peter Levi, who's the industry sector lead at the same division, uh, Hannah Mandova, uh, the industry sector energy analyst, and Tim Tiffany Bass, um, also industry sector energy uh, analyst. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me hand over to Timur Gu, who's the head of the Energy Technology Policy uh, Division at the IEA, for some introductory remarks. Um, Timur, over to you. Yeah, th thank you. Great the arguably troubling uh, circumstances here in Paris. I hope this finds you all very well, wherever um, all of you are um, today. A good morning and good evening, in fact, to you, depending on uh, the time zone that um, you're, uh, you're in. And uh, welcome, certainly, from our end as well, from the IA, um, to today's presentation of the Iron and Steel Technology Roadmap. Um, my name is Timo Gül, indeed. I head the Energy Technology Policy Division here at the IEA, which is broadly in charge of looking into um, the opportunities and challenges that come with different new and emerging clean energy technologies in different parts of uh, the energy sector. We do very detailed, in fact, uh, sectoral analysis for a whole range of uh, different uh, parts of the energy sector, of which um, this iron and steel technology uh, roadmap um, is obviously a part of. Before we go into today's um, discussion, let me first start off by thanking our colleagues at uh, World Steel, um, not only for hosting um, today's um, uh, webinar, but also for all the support, feedback, uh, engagement, encouragement, in fact, um, that uh, we received uh, throughout this project. Um, this project, as was already pointed out, is not a project that started just a couple of months ago and was finished in a rush, but in fact it was uh, started around uh, three years ago. Um, it was a very long process with um, uh, several international stakeholder workshops, um, which um, I understand many of you have attended in China, Brazil, in India, twice in Paris, so um, a lot of input that we received. Um, the process took a little longer um, than uh, expected towards the end for a variety of different reasons, uh, the pandemic being one of them, 
but also revamping um, of some of our uh, internal work here um, more broadly. I should tell you, um, if you are not aware yet, that uh, it was worth the wait. Um, the technology roadmap on iron and steel is really an excellent publication in my view um, uh, that um, will hopefully be uh, useful for all of you um, over the next uh, years to come as you're working towards uh, more sustainable steel making in your own um, operations. Let me just also say that this roadmap um, sits in a broader context, um, which is part of the reason why um, it took us a little longer here towards the end to finalize um, the roadmap. Um, it sits in a broader context of our energy technology perspectives publication that was released uh, in the beginning of um, September, and that looks into technology opportunities for reaching net zero emissions for the energy sector as a whole. So not only uh, decarbonization strategies for the iron and steel sector, but for um, cars, trucks, ships, uh, planes, for cement industry, um, for the chemical industry, for the power sector and various different other parts um, uh, of energy. So um, the output that you're seeing here for the iron and steel um, sector is really embedded into wider system considerations and helps us to form a much better view, I think, for um, the sustainable steel making um, in particular. Now, the roadmap um, that uh, we uh, launched on 8th of uh, October complements um, various different other parts of the IA roadmap series. We had uh, roadmaps for key heavy industry sectors such as cement chemicals uh, sector. We had roadmaps for many other parts of uh, the energy sector more broadly and the next is already underway. Um, so the colleagues that you're seeing here on the screen are already working on uh, the next one, um, uh, nitrogen fertilizer uh, industry roadmap that we are planning to uh, release um, towards uh, the end of uh, next year. So I understand that many of you um, have participated already in our launch and uh, it was a very widely attended launch, I should say, um, uh, with uh, over 600 registrations. Um, today is an opportunity to discuss the findings in much more depth um, with the colleagues um, that uh, have been leading this work um, over the last um, few uh, months in particular, but uh, years uh, more broadly. Um, you will have uh, seen Araceli fernandez Palis and Peter Levi already during the launch of um, this uh, roadmap, um, but they're joined today by Tiffany Vas and Hannah Mandawa, who um, uh, have been uh, carrying much of the work um, together um, with the two other colleagues as they, we were pre preparing this, um, this roadmap. Um, the way today's um, session is somewhat uh, structured is that we cover, um, we, our objective is to cover um, the material in four main um, section as, uh, sections as you see here on uh, the screen. We will have a short break after each of these um, four uh, sections. Um, that is an opportunity um, for you to um, ask clarifying questions, brief clarifying questions, if I may um, make this plea here, um, more to understand if there's a, a misunderstanding, if there's something unclear in, uh, in the way things have been presented or being uh, discussed. Our colleagues from World Steel, as um, it was uh, mentioned earlier, will gather these questions from the chat box and uh, put them forward to the team so that they can um, answer you. Um, these kind of uh, questions. We will then have an extended Q&A, which is more about the broader considerations um, where you can ask broader um, conceptual questions or engage into uh, discussion um, uh, with the colleagues um, that uh, have worked on this particular roadmap. You will obviously have the opportunity also to follow up with us um, afterwards. Um, so uh, all the questions that you hesitate to ask today, um, don't hesitate. Uh, to ask them um, to us um, afterwards. I'd now um, give the floor um, to my colleague Araceli fernandez Pares, um, who will kick off today's presentation and uh, introduce some of the key concepts and definitions that were used in the roadmap and that will be important for you to be aware of during the, um, uh, during the presentation. Araceli. Excellent. Many thanks, uh, Timor and also Osan, for the, for the introduction. So indeed, uh, on this first block of the uh, session, we just wanted to give you a bit of, uh, of uh, context of where the roadmap sits more broadly, with a brief um, touches on uh, these kind of synergies with other areas of the, of the energy system, which we've seen 
in the development of the, of the work that have been of great interest uh, for many stakeholders and also some uh, concepts and boundaries uh, so that you can understand uh, better uh, the more details that will be presented afterwards in the next uh, in the following uh, components of the presentation. So let me just start uh, a bit by uh, reinforcing a bit the point that Timur made uh, where uh, the iron steel roadmap is a component uh, that looks in more depth into the iron steel sector and how it contributes to the transition towards net zero emissions, which was the uh, core, let's say, uh, analytical question that we've put to ourselves when we explore the uh, Energy Technology Perspectives uh, 2020 edition. And when doing that for the whole energy system, uh, of course, when one looks at the different clean energy transitions that have been analyzed uh, by different uh, bodies, governments, etc., you can always see that power generation as a sector has a major contribution in this uh, emission reduction effort. And that's no surprise, considering that the, uh, gener the emissions from the sector uh, already account for more than 40% of energy-related emissions globally of the entire system. And at the same time, uh, we've seen good progress uh, and advancements in and renewable power generation. So we've, uh, of course, uh, kind of followed that, that trend in a way. But in our analysis, what we saw is that uh, even major efforts in the power generation wouldn't be really enough uh, to reach the gap, uh, reach the gap towards net zero emissions of the entire system. Actually, it would only bring us one third of the way we need to go in terms of emission reductions. And the reason of this is that, as you, uh, as you know very well, uh, emissions today come from many other sources, as uh, Timur was highlighting. Uh, already emissions from transport, industry, and the building sector account for more than half, so around 55% of the total emissions in the, in the uh, energy sector today. And so uh, tackling emissions from these sectors would be, uh, would be extremely uh, important. There's two specific areas uh, of um, let's say, a particular challenge in here when we think about long distance transport, but also in particular heavy industrial sectors, including the iron steel sector, uh, certainly, as well as chemicals and, and cement. Um, in these sectors, we see that low carbon technology options that would enable us to reach uh, near zero or zero emissions, uh, uh, let's say, technologies are really not as ready as uh, is the case for other, uh, for other sectors in the system. And so uh, reducing emissions from the sectors is, is much more challenging at the moment uh, compared to other, to other sectors. Indeed, um, as I've mentioned, uh, tackling emissions from a uh, heavy industrial sector is, is more difficult. And uh, there are specific reasons for this, I mean, of why this is the case. Uh, most of these sectors uh, rely on uh, heavily on fossil fuels which basically are used for uh, raising high temperature heat that is needed in the different processes, or uh, those fossil fuels are used as feedstocks or are reducing agents, as is the case in the iron steel sector, using coke uh, for uh, reducing uh, iron ore. And um, at the same time, most of these uh, processes, uh, on most of these cases, process emissions are also generated as part of the chemical reactions that take place. And so these uh, characteristics make it challenging uh, to find low carbon alternatives uh, to the established processes uh, nowadays. And so in this, uh, I mean, to find those uh, in most cases implies uh, designing, uh, developing and demonstrating new technologies that are not available at scale in markets uh, today. Even when those technologies would make it into markets after a large scale uh, demonstration, uh, the rollout of those technologies would still be uh, challenging if we think about how those assets, uh, particularly heavy industrial uh, sectors, are uh, capital intensive, they are also long lived. Um, and in most cases as well, these sectors are exposed to international trade, which means that they've got a, a particular, um, let's say, additional uh, challenge when it comes to the first movers in adopting low carbon technologies uh, while maintaining competitiveness, if uh, in particular uh, policies uh, targeting emission reductions are not being effective and are not uh, ensuring an even playing field. So those challenges make that, again, emissions from uh, those sectors are particularly hard to, to abate, to reduce. But despite this, uh, this context, in our sustainable development scenario, which is the, the core scenario, uh, again, exploring net zero emissions uh, or a transition towards net zero emissions, both in ETP 2020, but also in the steel roadmap, 
Um, we see that even in despite those challenges, the aerospace sector reduces its direct emissions more than uh, half by 2015, so around 55 percent compared to today. And this is in the realm of the, uh, let's say, emission reduction efforts that we've seen as well in that scenario for other heavy industrial sectors. Of course, if we look at uh, what's the pace of emission reductions for other, uh, other areas in the energy system, uh, such as power generation, as I mentioned before, we see a much faster decarbonization uh, rate. And that is, uh, of course, a reflection of the more, uh, let's say, advanced readiness or technology readiness of low carbon alternatives uh, to establish, let's say, or conventional power generation technologies, but also the good, um, in a way, momentum um, and uh, uh, progress that we've seen already uh, in rolling out uh, these technologies, translating into um, considerable cost reductions as well. Um, particularly for the steel sector, um, we wanted to understand through the technology roadmap what's the contribution of, uh, of iron steel making uh, to the transition to net zero emissions. And to do that for the roadmap, we've developed basically uh, two main scenarios. Uh, the first one uh, is our baseline scenario in which uh, we are projecting uh, current trends, also considering existing and announced policies and uh, simulating uh, what would be the implications of that context in terms of energy requirements uh, as well as emissions uh, from that specific sector. The other core scenario that we've explored in the technology roadmap, as well as in the uh, energy technology perspectives 2020, is our sustainable development scenario, as I've mentioned, which is the core mitigation scenario that looks into achieving net zero emissions at the whole system level by 2070 and at the, I mean, at the global level as well. And in here, as I've mentioned just before, uh, the aerospace sector already reduces emissions uh, in terms of its direct uh, footprint by more than half by 2050 but continues that path uh, moving forward and achieves almost 90% of reductions by 2070. Now, we wanted as well to look into a specific uh, case in which we would be understanding the feasibility of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 at the whole system level. Uh, and this is an analysis that we've undertaken in the framework again of the Energy Technology Perspectives 2020 in response to the growing number of uh, announces uh, and pledges for targets of reaching net zero emissions by governments and uh, industries uh, by 2050. And of course, even if that's not a globally adopted goal, we wanted to uh, understand what the feasibility of that uh, achieving that target would be, but in particular from the lenses of technology innovation. So that's why we've called this a faster innovation case in which we explore what would be the uh, implications in terms of the step ambition for uh, clean energy innovation in particular, so by reducing the time to introduce uh, new low carbon technologies to markets, uh, even for technologies that would be today at a small prototype or even at laboratory stage at the moment, and also a faster uh, deployment afterwards, one, afterwards once they've reached uh, commercial uh, status in a way. Um, the main implications of, of that case uh, for the iron steel sector are also uh, discussed and provided, uh, highlighted in the, in the technology roadmap report, and there will be more information on this uh, follow in the subsequent, uh, let's say, components of the, of the presentation, but wanted to, to bring it uh, to the attention uh, from the outset. Um, as you could see in that particular case, the steel sector will reach uh, direct emissions uh, reductions of uh, almost 90% ready by 2050, again, to to contribute to that uh, accelerated uh, transition. Now, with that kind of overall context on the different uh, type of scenarios, how the, the roadmap fits within the uh, overall transition for the energy sector, etc., there was a couple of more points that I wanted to highlight in terms of uh, context definitions uh, that would be useful for the uh, following discussions in the session. The first one is around uh, defining and describing the emissions accounting that we've used uh, in the roadmap. So you would see that uh, as we would have been through the roadmap, uh, the steel roadmap basically focuses on direct uh, CO2 emissions uh, in the steel sector, which would be related to uh, the use of fossil fuels, as well as process emissions in uh, processes related to either raw material preparation or iron making or steel making uh, within the sector. 
then indirect emissions that uh, would be attributable uh, to power uh, generation, I mean the generation of the electricity that would be consumed in the aerospace sector, um, are considered, as, as I said, indirect emissions, are not the core uh, analytical component of the roadmap, either uh, even if they are, uh, let's say, uh, that electricity is produced on site or it is imported from the electricity grid. And the reason to do this split is to avoid double counting with uh, other analysis and emissions reporting within the IEA, uh, where uh, we are producing as well particular, uh, let's say, uh, reports, uh, analysis for the power generation sector where those uh, emissions would be, uh, would be included. But having said that, uh, throughout the, uh, the roadmap, we've also um, provided uh, information on the course, in a way, and the trajectory of indirect emissions uh, for the iron steel sector to complement uh, the analysis on the direct emissions uh, where this was relevant, just to make sure that we could provide a, a full picture to the, uh, to the users and the readers of the, of the roadmap. And just as an example here, what you would see is that uh, indeed uh, indirect emissions for the iron steel sector also get reduced around uh, more than half uh, by 2050 in our sustainable development scenario, uh, encompassing, encompassing the efforts that we've seen in the uh, direct emission reduction. So in the core, let's say, uh, uh, fuel consumption, as well as process emissions coming from the uh, core processes in the, uh, in the sector. Um, after that, I uh, wanted to move uh, a bit uh, towards setting a bit the context of today's uh, iron steel uh, sector structure in terms of production routes uh, to set a little bit the, the let's say, the, the current stand, uh, the starting point for the analysis. Um, just to start uh, in a way by uh, highlighting, as you all uh, very well know, that uh, global steel production is uh, at the moment uh, currently dominated by uh, the basic oxygen forest route, which accounts for around 70% uh, of the global production, with the remainder uh, being uh, or going through the electric, uh, electric route, as you see in the slide. Um, when we look at the uh, split between primary and secondary, we've seen that almost 80% of the production of steel today is related to, uh, let's say, the reduction of iron ore. Uh, which has more, uh, let's say, or larger uh, energy uh, demand implications compared to secondary, uh, secondary production. And so this has, uh, or, or translates, has implications to translate into uh, iron accounting uh, for about 70% uh, of the uh, total metallic charge uh, globally today. This gives a, a full picture, of course, that you all have very well in your, in your heads. Um, the other uh, component just wanted uh, to highlight in this introduction uh, uh, block in a way for the for the webinar was about again uh, building on uh, the importance of uh, these uh, primary routes for the production of steel and uh, the uh, specific equipment and assets that are associated with those routes such as glass furnaces or direct uh, reduced iron furnaces which are uh, the main uh, emissions intensive equipment within the iron steel sector uh, we just wanted to, uh, to give a bit of context on uh, the analysis that we did in terms of existing infrastructure in that, in that respect, uh, particularly considering that those assets are capital intensive and long-lived, as I've mentioned, uh, being one of the main, main challenges in terms of abating emissions from uh, this sector, but other heavy industrial sectors as well. Actually, we've estimated that the, uh, existing, uh, those existing assets, glass furnaces, direct reduced iron furnaces, uh, if they were to continue operating at the current uh, conditions uh, until they, let's say, reach their end of their typical lifetime, they could emit around 65 gigatons of CO2 emissions, which is equivalent to uh, more or less two years uh, of energy-related emissions from the entire energy system. So, of course, um, addressing those uh, emissions from those existing assets is a core, uh, let's say, central or a core need on this transition towards net zero emissions, which otherwise wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible. And so what you see in this slide, uh, as we've presented as well in the launch, uh, you can see um, an histogram that shows the average age profile of those existing assets across different regions, which has been calculated, taking into account when was the, day, the latest uh, major refurbishment undertaken in those, uh, in those particular assets. Um, 
when you look at this comparing you know what a typical lifetime would be of around 40 years uh, compared to the different at age levels of uh, these different uh, let's say uh, process equipment in different regions uh, we've seen that on average um, this type of assets are around 13 years old uh, again uh, so quite young compared to to that typical uh, lifetime now um, you can see, of course, uh, the predominant role of China in terms of absorbing or concentrating uh, over uh, si uh, around 60% of the iron making uh, stock today. And most of that stock having, uh, let's say, get into, uh, into commission or into operations over the last, uh, the last two decades. When we look at some advanced economies, um, such as Europe, for instance, we've seen uh, quite uh, relatively uh, renewed, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fleets, uh, which uh, in these cases, uh, this is quite likely that blast furnaces, for instance, have gone through a, a major refurbishment um, uh, recently, uh, which again uh, makes a, a quite a challenge when it comes to uh, the remainder uh, operational time of those assets until the end of their, of their lifetimes. Now, of course, there's uh, different strategies that can be taken into account or can be considered or implemented uh, to reduce emissions from these assets. Uh, there's very different uh, energy efficiency improvements, also strategies that could be taking place. Uh, there's also possibilities of blending in alternative fuels, uh, such as low carbon hydrogen, but also bioenergy, uh, so to reduce the emission footprint again of, this, of these assets, but also, of course, uh, integrating carbon capture storage um, or as you to capture for use in as retrofits, uh, so to avoid in a way the earlier retirement of some of these of some of these assets. Um, now the opportunity as well that comes uh, with uh, with this uh, aspect of uh, how to deal with existing assets that we've looked into uh, was that within these dynamics of uh, investment cycles of around uh, every 25 years or so, when uh, these assets need to go through a major uh, let's say refurbishment uh, of an investment uh, equivalent to the to the size of a brand new plant. If we think about, for instance, the relying of a blast furnace, <clears throat> sorry, then we could see that uh, this is a, a very important milestone and point in time for those assets to uh, integrate uh, or to make a step change uh, in their emissions footprint and change the course of their emissions trajectories. So we've analyzed what would be the implications of. Uh, taking advantage of uh, those upcoming investment cycles in these uh, specific assets across different regions and integrate low carbon technology alternatives, uh, considering that innovation efforts would be aligned and prioritized so that those technologies would be ready by then. And that would imply that uh, the projected emissions that were estimated at around 65 gigatons from those assets would be cut by half if those, uh, again, in that specific opportunity window would be, uh, would be considered. And of course, exploit it. So, yeah, I just wanted to highlight again this uh, particular issue of existing assets because I think it's very relevant for the discussion as well. And with this, I wanted to conclude the uh, the introduction, uh, let's say, block of the presentation, so that then we can go uh, in different uh, in different components and go in more depth on the uh, let's say um, projections and uh, forward-looking analysis moving forward. So with this, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague Tiffany Bass, which is going to be presenting on the production and demand outlooks uh, underpinning the, the roadmap. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Araceli. Um, so yeah, this next section is going to be covering the outlook for steel demand and production. And so demand for steel is a key driver of emissions in the sector, and thus understanding likely trends for future demand is integral to any scenario looking at future emissions. So to begin with the present, the iron and steel sector has been significantly impacted by the COVID-19 crisis, as have most other sectors of the economy. The world's largest steel producer, China, was one of the first economies impacted by the crisis. And despite a relatively modest drop in production in the first couple months of 2020, production in China has recovered quite quickly, such that total production from January to August of this year was actually 4% higher than in the same months in 2019. Now, most other economies haven't been so lucky. 
During the same period, declines in steel production of nearly 20% relative to the previous year were seen in the EU and India, and an average decline of 11% was seen in the rest of the world. So taken together, the global steel production was 4% lower in this period relative to the previous year. And so while the near future is quite uncertain, steel is a vital material for our society. And we've seen that over the past 30 years, steel demand has increased by 2.5 times and has recovered relatively quickly from past crises, such as the 2008 global financial crisis. And so in our baseline projection, steel production recovers within a couple of years and grows by 35% by 2050, from around 1.9 billion tons today to around 2.5 billion tons in 2050. Now many opportunities exist to use steel more efficiently and thus to produce less steel while providing the same level of material services. In turn, lower, lower steel production results in lower emissions. And so we assume ambitious pursuit of such strategies in our sustainable development scenario, such that steel demand is reduced by around 20% in 2050 relative to the baseline. Now to go deeper into the drivers of this production outlook, we need to consider the different sources of steel demand. So today, the largest demand segments are buildings, which account for about one third of end use demand and infrastructure accounting for a little over 20%. Meanwhile, vehicles account for 15%, mechanical and electrical equipment for just under 20% and consumer goods for a bit over 10%. Meanwhile, we see pre-consumer scrap generated both in steel plants and in the process of manufacturing final goods, accounting for about 20% of total steel production. Now, what about the future? In both our scenarios, the generation of pre-consumer scrap declines as a proportion of steel production. But as can be seen by the sectoral breakdown, steel remains a critical ingredient across all sectors of the economy in both scenarios. Of course, consumers do not demand steel per se. They rather demand the services that steel provides. It is the stocks of steel in society, in our infrastructure, our vehicles, our homes that provides us with these services. And so as economies mature, the stocks of steel in society tend to saturate. And at this point, steel demand is for replenishing steel that reaches end of life rather than increasing stocks. In both scenarios we explore, the global average in use steel stock per capita grows by about 50% through to 2050. That is, it reaches just over six tons for every person on earth, up from just over four tons today. This growth is driven primarily in emerging economies that are building up their infrastructure and acquiring more goods. Now in Africa is only a bit lower than in the baseline, despite somewhat lower production. And this is because key material efficiency strategies will either hold steel in use for longer or may improve yields, neither of which reduces stock levels. Now to take a closer look at material efficiency, material efficiency strategies are measures that make more efficient use of steel while still providing the same material service. This includes measures taken all across the value chain from the steel manufacturing plant to downstream designers and manufacturers, all the way to the use and end of life phases. Now it's important to note that in the sustainable development scenario, steel used to build clean energy infrastructure drives up demand in particular end use segments with demand from the power sector in 2050 about three times higher than in the baseline projection and for rail infrastructure about one third higher. However, these segments account for a relatively small share of total end use steel demand to begin with, and so these increases are far away by the combined impact of demand reduction from material efficiency. Now, a non negligible portion of the demand reduction occurs by improving yields, that is, by reducing scrap generation during manufacturing. Some potential for the, this improvement is present within the steel sector boundary, but the larger proportion occurs in the manufacturing of final goods. And so these yield improvements together reduce demand in the 2050 by 4% in the sustainable development scenario relative to the baseline. Now a much larger contribution is made by changes in the design and use of certain steel products, aspects that are outside the direct control of the steel industry. Steel demand for buildings can be reduced with improved design and construction practices, which account for about a 2.5% reduction in demand in 2050 relative to the baseline. 
The single largest contributor to demand reduction is extending the lifetime of buildings and counting for a 6% reduction in demand in 2050. Today, many bu buildings are demolished before the end of their technical lifetime. And so taking the opportunity to refurbish and repurpose these buildings leads to a considerable reduction in material demand. In the vehicle supply chain, light weighting is pursued to improve fuel economy in the sustainable development scenario. And this contributes to a 2% reduction in steel demand in 2050. Meanwhile, reduction in vehicle sales drive a driven by changes in transport activity account for an additional 2% reduction in steel demand. Finally, direct reuse of steel products without remelting them, such as beams recovered from demolished buildings, reduces steel demand by a further 3%. Overall, we see steel demand being reduced by about 20% in 2050 relative to our baseline from these various material efficiency strategies. Um, and so here we'll take a pause now for any clarifying questions on these past couple of sections. Um, so I think I would pass it back to Asa. Uh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, in fact, I think we have only received um, one uh, question and it sort of relates to Araceli's uh, part of the presentation around the age of the capacities. So does the age of capacities reflect uh, refurbishment um, made? Yeah, on this slide, exactly. Thanks, Asa. Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to clarify. So indeed, I mean, the way um, the average age, sorry, let me show you like this. So the way the average age of these emission intensive assets were calculated was uh, relative to the latest, so the date of the last major refurbishment one that was made in the core process equipment or a major piece, again, of, of an investment that would be um, uh, equivalent to the size of a brand new, so uh, a brand new facility so, or equipment. So in a way, the, one of the core examples here would be uh, the realignment, uh, uh, the realigning of, uh, of uh, the insulation of a blast furnace, uh, for instance. So that's why, as I was describing, you could see that uh, there are some, uh, let's say, assets uh, or some stocks, for instance, we look at Europe where we see a relatively uh, young age, uh, which uh, for some people could be a bit counterintuitive uh, because we consider that uh, that particular uh, aspect of refurbishment indeed. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that was in fact the only clarifying question, so apparently everything is very clear. Uh, that's excellent, so you can go ahead. Are we okay there on the screen? We just changed over. Great. Um, so, yeah, just to recap what Timothy left off, um, there are set elements of the sustainable trajectory that we outlined that um, where the energy system will consume more steel, will consume steel more intensively. And the overall um, impact of material efficiency strategies outweighs this, uh, outweighs this uplift. But of course, material efficiency is not just one of a portfolio of measures, mitigation strategies adopted in the iron and steel sector and in the sustainable development scenario. And this scenario, as I recently clarified at the beginning, is one in which uh, emissions, direct emissions, drop by more than 50% uh, by 2050. In the short term, it's material efficiency and technology performance improvements um, that uh, contribute to the lion's share of uh, emissions mitigation. In the, uh, in the sustainable development scenario. Uh, more than 90% on a cumulative basis uh, to 2030 stem from these two measures, these two first measures. While these measures play critical roles, they're incremental and, and alone they can't deliver a step change in emissions intensity or crude steel production. Um, when we look at the whole modeling horizon, so the cumulative emissions through from 2020 to 2050 in the sustainable development scenario, and that's the emissions reductions relative to the baseline, material efficiency is still the largest contributor overall at around 40% of cumulative reductions. Technology performance improvements deliver around a fifth, and this category includes the adoption of best available technologies and improvements to the way processes are operated and controlled and integrated on the site. This might be a smaller share than one might have thought, um, but this reflects the fact that 
um, a lot of increases in uh, energy efficiency are already well incentivized in our baseline uh, trajectory. Hydrogen and CCUS together contribute around a quarter of the cumulative emissions reductions, and I'll come into these and the, the roles of various innovative technologies on the, on the next slide. And a series of other measures, including the use of bioenergy, other fuel shifts, including net to natural gas and electricity, um, contribute the remaining portion of the emissions reductions in the sustainable development scenario. Um, just a quick word on electrification. Um, this looks more in the sustainable development scenario results. But this is um, because the shift in the metallics slate on the shares of iron and scrap that Araceli showed at the beginning, the shift of these over time also take place to a large extent in the, in the baseline data policy scenario. So that's why the, the delta here between the two scenarios is, is not that large. Bioenergy, although it plays an important role, faces sustainability constraints. Um, and we see it already commercially uh, as being as commercially in use in certain regions today, and that would continue in our, in our baseline scenario as well. So now I'd just like to unpack um, the role that each of the technology, main technology families play um, by looking at the uh, these specific groups of processes in the sustainable development scenario. The first thing to note is that both primary and secondary conventional processes do still play a role in 2050. Um, but the trajectories among them diverge. Um, the scrap-based electric arc furnace route uh, nearly doubles its share of crude steel production by 2050. This is globally. And while the share attributable to the blast furnace based oxygen furnace route um, declines from around three quarters today um, to around 30% uh, in 2050. CCUS equipped routes, including innovative blast furnaces, DRI and smelting reduction concepts account for around a quarter of primary production by 2050, up from one single commercial plant in the United Arab Emirates today. Hydrogen is used both as a blending option in DRI furnaces and in blast furnaces, um, but also in the pure hydrogen-based DRI route um, later in the, in the projection plus. This, this route alone counts for around 15% of primary production by 2050 in the sustainable development scenario. These process shifts have a profound impact on the energy mix of the sector, which can be seen today in the, on the first and the left in the second graph there. Um, unabated fossil fuel use declines from around 85% of final energy inputs of the sector today to around 45% in 2050. Electricity demand uh, surges, more than doubling its share of final energy consumption by 2050. Um, and just under a third of its total electricity usage is for producing electricity, electrolytic hydrogen. Bioenergy also increases its share dramatically, but as mentioned uh, before, um, its overall consumption is, uh, is limited to more by uh, available sustainable supplies. So those are the headline results of our analysis, but of course underlying these results are a whole series of regional um, figures and, and, and considerations. Before I delve into the, the regional context, I just wanted to provide some more detail on one of the key factors um, that determines the competitiveness of these various technologies um, in our scenario, um, and that is production cost. So using the simplified levelized cost, as a, as a proxy for production costs, we can break down the four main cost components um, into capex, opex, raw material costs, and uh, fuel or energy costs. Um, so here we're showing the regional average costs of each route at the time they become available, and that information about when they become available is displayed above each bar. Um, and we're also showing here the emissions intensities. I should note that there, there are a lot of assumptions that go into compiling this type of information, and we've detailed all of these in the original uh, depiction of the figure in, uh, in the roadmap itself. So if you want to know the fuel price range and, and various other considerations about um, capacity factors and so on that are used to compile these figures, then these are um, uh, available in, in the roadmap. Um, I should note just explicitly here that no cost for CO2 being emitted is imposed on the, on the analysis, but cost for uh, CO2 transport and storage is included in the kind of dark blue or black uh, segments on the, on the routes that use CCUS there. 
Um, the integrated route comes out as the cheapest uh, route in, in most contexts and regions, um, but of course it's, it's highly emissions intensive. And the CCUS equipped innovative smelting reduction route comes out as the cheapest option among those that achieve substantial emissions reductions, um, or substantial, substantial reductions in emissions intensity. The avoided need for a co-carbon and agglomeration processes in this, in this technology arrangement reduces capex, but this is somewhat, somewhat uh, compensated for by the additional costs of uh, applying CO2 capture. And the CCUS equipped uh, DRI or gas-based DRI um, bars are shown in the middle there, the results for that one shown in the middle, and um, slightly more expensive than their unabated uh, counterpart. Um, uh, but this is um, the, the capture cost is not imposing that much of a penalty. And the hydrogen-based DRI route comes out as the most the more expensive uh, among the options explored here. And um, although I should note that this analysis assumes the um, grid electricity prices that we have um, in in the model for this uh, range that's shown here in the in the dashed uh, bars above the above the solid colour bars, I should note that. The, yeah, the grey dashed uh, lines show this regional range of costs um, with the different uh, energy and, and uh, uh, maybe energy price variation that's uh, captured across our regions in our model. Comparing broadly across these routes, the, um, the innovative routes and the, emission, the routes that achieve substantial emission reductions compared to those that don't, we're looking at about a 10% to a 50% uh, premium for the innovative routes, depending on the pairing considered for comparison. The costs, of course, are not the only consideration when we look at the evolution of the technology portfolio and the sustainable development scenario. And they are, in each major region, we examine in detail um, a variety of other quantitative factors, including the availability of certain resources, such as bioenergy, and also uh, the uh, qualitative, uh, certain qualitative factors, such as the trajectory, um, sorry, sorry, such as the technology strategies and their, um, how amenable a given policy context is to specific, uh, to specific policies. We also look at the technology strategies adopted in other heavy industry sectors within a region to look at the compatibility there. So here on the left, we can see the same technology summary that I provided a couple of slides ago. And then if we delve into each of the regions in a bit more detail, starting with China, we can see here in China, the, the hallmark of the transition here is really a, a, a large scale switch over to secondary production. And this requires a rapid decommissioning of existing glass furnaces, which is facilitated by increased scrap availability from a maturing building and vehicle stock um, in conjunction with declining demand for new infrastructure and the redoubling of efforts um, to reduce uh, overcapacity in this area, prioritizing the least efficient units. And the, the, uh, China still deploys innovative routes at large scale, but because of the phase out of the existing fleet um, of primary production facilities, facilities um, because this is quite well aligned with increased scrap availability, the country begins deploying these innovative routes a bit later than some other, than some other regions. And the CCUS equipped uh, innovative smelting reduction route and hydrogen based uh, DRI route are deployed in almost equal proportions in 2050, together accounting for around one third of primary steel making capacity by then. Um, China's uh, large dam, low cost renewable electricity, I should say, is one of the, um, one of the reasons that it underpins uh, this hybrid approach, along with its uh, early experience. In CCUS uh, deployment in industrial sectors that's already underway today. So moving to Europe, in stark contrast uh, with China, the availability of scrap remains fairly constant throughout the projection horizon. Um, Europe has a long-established glass furnace fleet and an old one when measured since the year of first installation. RSLE um, showed some figures uh, measured since the date of uh, latest refurbishment. Um, this factor, along with the fact that the EU has demonstrated a commitment to a variety of um, research and demonstration projects um, and has looked into the hydrogen and CCUS value chains beyond the steel industry, and uh, leads the region to adopt a diversified portfolio of options, including both carbon avoidance and carbon management uh, options. 
options. India, I will leave for a second and come to you on the next slide as we include the chapter focus on this region. So next we have the United States and the Middle East, which adopt a similar strategy when it comes to innovative technology deployment, taking advantage of low cost uh, natural gas that these regions have access to and the um, gas based CGS equipped DRI uh, process arrangement. The key factor differentiating the two regions is the growth trajectory um, of, in terms of steel production uh, and the availability of scrap. Um, we have fairly flat production levels and high, the highest share of scrap and metallic inputs in the US, in contrast to the Middle East, where we have growing production um, that outpaces uh, the, the increase in scrap. Access to low-cost solar PV electricity also plays a role in the Middle East. Um, and the need for continued capacity additions in the second uh, part of the projection horizon um, leads to uh, you know, additional innovative routes uh, needing to be deployed. And so this is uh, once the hydrogen-based route becomes commercially available, this is uh, attractive in this region. I'm taking a bit of a long time, so I think I'll I'm not go into too much detail on the remaining regions, but um, on Central and South America and, and Africa, we can see a mix of the strategies being adopted and echoed, um, yeah, some of the strategies in other regions echoed in these two regions. These are small but fast growing regions, and uh, these were additional details that we provided um, in the roadmap. Um, in particular, you can see in, in Central and South America and a bit in North Africa uh, within, the, within the African continental region, um, um, exploitation of this uh, lower cost uh, gas in Argentina, say, and uh, bits of North Africa. So the DRI was its US route, um, uh, looking attractive there. And then, of course, in Africa, with uh, vast, uh, vast amounts of um, low-cost renewable energy potential in the future, um, the hydrogen-based DRI route becoming attractive there. So just returning to India briefly, India is a critical region for the future of sustainable steelmaking. And this is the region where we project many, much of the capacity additions uh, to take place in our, in our scenarios. We've included a dedicated chapter focus on India for this reason. And, and by 2050, we can see that steel production is more than three times uh, current levels in India, so underscoring this, uh, this, the criticality of this region, even factoring in, even after factoring in the material efficiency uh, strategies that Tiffany uh, took us through. Um, the scrap share of metallic uh, inputs um, still rises slightly to just over a quarter in 2050 in, in India and just, from just over a fifth in 2019, but remains well below uh, the levels that we see in some uh, mature uh, economies today, such as the United States um, and, uh, and Europe. Um, the limited availability of scrap in conjunction with rising levels of output means that India builds large amounts of uh, new primary steel making capacity during the projection period. Some of this additional capacity is required before other innovative technologies are available. And, and this, uh, this underscores the, the need for uh, CCUS uh, retrofits or CCUS ready designs um, in those uh, primarily last furnace additions up until the early 2030s. Um, in parallel to this evolution of the, of the block furnace stock, the CGS equipped uh, innovative smelting reduction route also plays a large role, deployed from the late 20, uh, 20s, reaching more than 70 million tons of, of output in 2050, which is run roughly one new unit every year during the period 2013 to 2050. And um, while this route is uh, and, uh, achievable, if it's, uh, while it's still ambitious, it's, uh, it's only half the story. The hydrogen-based DRI route is also deployed um, and alongside the innovative smelting reduction um, route, taking advantage of India's access to uh, cost uh, renewable energy um, in the form of uh, solar PV and, and wind. And uh, that's a topic that I just wanted to come to into in a bit more detail on the um, subsequent slide, the last one in this section. Um, so we can see that the importance of the hydrogen-based DRI route in, in India in 2050 is, uh, is, is uh, significant and its uh, trajectory at that point is one of, of strong growth. Um, so we, uh, we wanted to look into a bit more detail at um, the various ways in which that route could be deployed in the country. 
And so I wanted to go into a bit more depth analysis here that's included in, in the publication and um, that we did with some help from our colleague, uh, Julian uh, Amichel. So our estimate for the cost of hydrogen-based DRI production in India in 2035, the date at which we see this route being deployed at large scale globally, is a, just over $600 uh, per megawatt hour. This assumes a grid electricity price of around $70 per megawatt hour. And because the grid is not fully decarbonized by this point in India in the sustainable development scenario, the emissions intensity, including indirect emissions uh, from uh, hydrogen emission, um, the uh, CO2 intensity of this route, including these indirect emissions, is around 800 grams of CO2 per ton of crude steel. Sorry, 800 kilograms of, of CO2 per ton of crude steel. Um, an alternative approach to using uh, grid electricity is to harness variable renewable electricity directly, um, and this uh, would be done in a captive installation of uh, either solar PV or wind or, or a mixture. By 2035, solar PV generation in India is expected to achieve costs of around $20 per megawatt hour and wind at around $30 per megawatt hour in certain locations in India. And um, so this, this makes this uh, route attractive in terms of being able to get access to that ultra low cost uh, electricity. Um, a small amount of grid electricity is still required to provide firm up electricity to, uh, to various bits of the process and on days when there is a low availability of, of either irradiation or low wind speeds. And so this is why we still see some positive uh, indirect uh, emissions intensity um, associated with the with the routes here. And the important thing to stress here, though, is the the requirement for flexibility. So process flexibility on one hand, or flexibility provided on the supply side by the use of hydrogen or battery storage. And um, we estimate that the uh, um, ad added flexibility can res uh, result in around five to fifteen percent. Uh, decline in costs relative to a uh, case in which there is no flexibility provided um, uh, or relative to inflexible process conditions. Um, but this is uh, particularly this is only in the cases where you are paying for high high cost uh, hydrogen storage in the form of steel tanks, where low cost uh, hydrogen storage is available in, in salt caverns or other kind of uh, beneficial geographies, then um, advantageous geographies, I should say then this, uh, the, the added benefit of this flexibility is much lower. So with that, I'd like to take another quick uh, pause and, and pass back to Paul's there at World Steel to um, see if there are any clarifying questions on this component of the presentation before I pass to my colleague Hannah uh, to go into more details on innovation and infrastructure. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Peter. Um, I have two questions uh, for you. The first one relates to blue hydrogen and where that sits in your uh, modeling. Is it under CCUS or, or under hydrogen? Thanks, that's a very, very good question. So in our system-wide uh, decomposition analysis and in the decomposition analysis that we include in this publication, the role of hydrogen shown in the, in the wedge graphs is, uh, is electrolytic hydrogen. So people sometimes refer to this as green hydrogen. This is, this is specifically electrolytic hydrogen. The role of CCUS in the decomposition, whether it's for hydrogen production or whether it's for capturing process emissions or whether it's for capturing fossil fuel emissions that are not to do with the production of hydrogen, these are categorized under the CCUS, um, CCUS decomposition lever, if you like, so the CCUS contribution to emissions reductions. Um, the, there is one kind of key uh, um, application of blue hydrogen, as it's sometimes called uh, by the hydrogen in the hydrogen community. This is uh, hydrogen generation from fossil fuels um, with CCUS applied. And the key uh, application in the steel sector here in our analysis would be the uh, DRI, conventional DRI route with CCUS applied, which we have one uh, demonstration project for this, uh, sorry, we have one commercial project for this operating. In the, in the Middle East at the moment. This would be something that we would categorize as, as blue hydrogen uh, production. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I've received one more question. So I have two questions uh, more. I'll, I'll read them both to you and then maybe you can take both of them uh, before we move on. So the first one is, given that capacity is yet to rise in Africa, uh, why is the blast furnace UF proportion rising? And the second one is, as far as costs for the ri based routes, did you consider direct hot charging in the electric arc furnace? Well, just very quickly on, on the first question, yeah, I, I, I understood it as being, why, if there is not much capacity in Africa at the moment, why, why is there um, growth there in the future? Is that right? Well, the question is um, because uh, the capacity in Africa is estimated to continue to rise. Um, but why is there a rise in blast furnace? The way, the way I see it is that new capacity should really be new, new technologies, right? Blast furnaces. I would not expect to see um, a lot of blast furnaces and that rise in capacity. What's your view on that? Yes, so in our, in our results, indeed, we do have rising output from Africa, and this requires additional, additional capacity to be built. And where this is a, an unabated or standard commercial blast furnace, this will be shown as the, I think it was the, the blue section of that bar for the, uh, for the Africa results. And where, where it is a, an innovative blast furnace concept or a, a blast furnace concept that is um, uh, allows uh, carbon capture to be retrofitted to it in some arrangement or another, then this would be shown, I think, as the light blue uh, color in the, in the legend of that, in that graph. Okay. And then yeah, the last. Quickly... Oh, sorry. Oh, please go. Thanks, Asa. Yeah, just a quick, uh, a quick compliment because I think the sounds not good, so maybe parts of the question were a bit cut, but I think the, the question was around as well. Um, I mean, the underlying dynamics of why we see in the African region, uh, let's say, a rising uh, share of blast furnace, uh, basic oxygen furnace routes um, going forward, given the growth in, in capacity, I mean, scientific growth in capacity. And I think it's, it's actually, I mean, that's one of the actual, let's say, influencing parameters. So uh, the Africa region, I mean, is one that grows in relative terms quite significantly from the current uh, state of play. Uh, which implies that uh, some of this growth happens in the, let's say, short term, in the spectrum of the time horizon of the uh, of the modeling for their uh, technology roadmap. And so um, there's also a, a lack of time, in a way, between um, now and when these uh, low carbon innovative processes will become available. So there's a bit of a locked in effect there where uh, capacity grows uh, using existing technologies and gets locked in the stock in that region uh, before it can switch to, to other options. Uh, and so then, then there's a bit more inertia uh, behind that. Okay, thanks a lot for the clarification. Just to repeat the last question, did you consider also hot charging in the, from the DRI to, to the AF? So in, in some regions we do have a continuation of this practice where we, where we see it uh, today. So we do have some uh, electrical furnaces uh, charged with the DRI. We also have a mixture of um, different ion charges to our different electric furnaces that we, we model in with the rehabbing model. Um, but then in general, where we're showing these routes, uh, these clusters of routes in, in the future, they are twinned with the furnace, with the electric furnace or uh, oxygen plant based oxygen furnace that is shown in, in the root in the root term title. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's uh, move on to the next uh, part. Mm -hmm. So, hello everyone, thank you uh, for joining. So, in my slides, I'm going to now divert a bit of the focus from iron and steel and start looking into innovation from the whole system and then come back to steel and try to identify how much innovation is belonging in iron and steel and together with infrastructure and investments that iron and steel has to undertake in the next 30 years. So, um, So as we've heard from Peter in previous section, clean energy technologies for the iron and steel production are 
really the key to reach net zero emissions. However, their deployment has to come across all sectors, not just iron and steel. And that's because clean energy technologies bring multiple benefits if it's related from cultural, uh, economical, environmental, and so on. But apart from reducing emissions, it's important to also highlight the broad push that broad push for clean energy technologies can provide opportunities for spillovers, which we where original application of an innovation allows an adoption of a technology in a new application as a result. Uh, an example could be, for example, the adoption of lithium ion batteries in vehicles after they have been extensively developed for consumer goods. This is something that in our ETP special report, uh, we highlighted the focus and focus uh, and looked in more details. But now with an intention to provide this holistic overview of all clean energy technologies, just not just for iron and steel, but for the whole energy system in general, we have published an ETP clean energy technology guide which poster form you can just see on your screens here. Now, this interactive framework uh, contains information on, all of, on over 400 individual technology designs and components across the whole energy system. For each technology, if you go on this website, you can, the guy includes various information such as level of maturity, current deployment, and deployment plans and so on. Using filters, you can also select and filter technologies based on all of the various criteria that it allows. So below here is the provided link. So please go and explore yourself and don't stay limited just within the technologies in the iron and steel sector. Now, staying on the topic of clean energy technologies and the energy sector as a whole. For majority of sectors, clean energy technologies require innovation. To reach net zero emissions from the energy system as a whole, we will need to deploy a whole range of clean energy technologies. This is ranging from electricity to hydrogen, from CCUS to sustainable bioenergy, and so on. We can, of course, discuss which exact technologies or fuels will contribute how much for which sector by the time of net zero. But ultimately, how much will depend on government and business choices that will be made over the next decade. But one thing is clear. We cannot negotiate the importance of clean energy innovation. In the IEA's sustainable development scenario, one third of the emission savings required for reaching net zero emissions by 2070 come from technologies that are not yet commercial today. As Araceli mentioned in the introduction, apart from sustainable development scenario, we also analyzed a faster innovation case to see to what extent innovation would be needed for reaching net zero emissions by 2050. The result is that almost half of all emission savings would be would need to come from technologies that are not yet commercially available today. And this reliance is even higher on pre-commercial technologies when we start zooming from whole sector, zooming in from whole sector and whole energy sector to hard to abate sectors, which include heavy industry and long distance transport. For those together, pre-commercial technologies deliver about three quarters of all emission savings by 2050. Such reliance on pre-commercial technologies is one is the same degree, in the same degree applicable in the iron and steel sector as it is uh, in the hard to abate sectors overall, as shown here. And in the next slide, I will now present further details on and start focusing further on the iron and steel. So the role of innovative technologies for the iron and steel sector is underscored when we look at the dimension of innovation required to reach emission targets in the sustainable development scenario when we compare this to baseline scenario. Focusing just on year 2050, we can see that 
just under half of the emission reductions stem from technologies that are either at demonstration or last a prototype stages today. This is showing us that deep emission reductions will not be possible unless the technologies currently at early stages of development are carried through to commercial de deployment and uh, mainly rapidly scaled up. We are here specifically talking about uh, technologies such as hydrogen-based DRI route or the innovative smelting reduction route, which are currently progressing through successively large pilot and demo projects. However, as you can see, if these technologies are not followed through, the pathway we outline in the sustainable development scenario will not be possible. Now, some companies and governments have announced net zero targets for 2050. This is, of course, not a globally adopted goal, but in our analysis, we wanted to look into the feasibility of actually reaching it through technology innovation alone. For this, we can see that uh, the previously mentioned faster innovation case, uh, we, for this, we, we can demonstrate it uh, via the faster innovation case. And the result is that we would need another one gigaton of emission reductions that would be more than uh, in the sustainable scenario to achieve um, such goal by 2050. And most importantly, this would mean complete step change in ambition when it comes to innovation. In details, also the prerequisites for this case meant that the technologies at demonstration and prototype stage today need to reach markets within the next six years which is actually twice as fast as in the sustainable development scenario. Also, technology at small prototype stage would need to become commercially available over the next decade and scale up rapidly thereafter. This would be an example for the iron ore electrolysis. So this faster innovation case, as shown on the right-hand side graph, underscores the importance of accelerating efforts in innovation to really reach the net zero emissions by 2050. But at the same time, it also shows that our chances of achieving such, such a goal would be much greater if technology efforts were to complement it by behavioral change as well. Now, the steel sector does not operate in a vacuum and the changes in the way steel is produced have significant implications for other energy sector infrastructure particularly when we are focusing on the requirement on the CO2 transport and storage and electrolytic hydrogen production. So today, around 1,400 megatons of iron is produced each year, where virtually all of it is without the use of CCUS or electrolytic hydrogen. By 2050, the, indeed this increased crop availability and the adoption of material efficiency strategies drop the overall iron and steel production, iron production only slightly. But then around 40% of the total iron that is produced is now going to be produced using electrolytic hydrogen or with co-deployment of CCUS. In terms of CCUS infrastructure, as of today, only 0.8 megaton of CO2 is captured across the iron and steel sector. However, the 300 megaton of iron produced via CCUS equipped units by 2050 implies that the need for infrastructure that is able to capture, transport and store uh, around 400 megaton of CO2 per year indeed would have to be taking place. Now, to put these 400 megaton of CO2 into perspective, this means basically installation of a large CO2 capture facility that is able to capture 1 million ton of CO2 per year every two to three weeks from 2030 up until 2050. This challenge is equally impressive also when we start talking about hydrogen production and the corresponding infrastructure that it would require. Um, 
around 5 million tons of dedicated hydrogen production is currently used in DRI units today, which is, however, mixed with carbon monoxide and virtually all is, uh, is without CCUS. By 2050, the total hydrogen volumes expands to around 23 million tons, with three quarters of it then being generated via low carbon routes. That means that uh, the electrolytic portion of this low carbon hydrogen, which is the vast, vast majority, or it's roughly 16 million tons, would require an, a new 700 terawatt hours of electricity per year by 2050. So when we look at this, we can straight away point out that besides the gigawatt hours of renewable power infrastructure, that this would require. Meeting this uh, hydrogen demand would require installation of electrolyzer capacity, which is more than 800 times than what is existing across the energy system today. And this would be just for the iron and steel sector. So indeed, the infrastructure is um, infrastructure development that has to happen in the next three years is 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 significant. So in the previous slide, I've given an overview of the required infrastructure from the hydrogen and CCUS point of view. But now I'm going to talk about the size of investment required by the iron and steel sector alone as a whole. So the regional spread of investment from now until 2050 is closely tied to the distribution of steel production across regions. As a result, China takes the largest cumulative investment share, accounting for about 26% of global total investment. And representing this is representing the refurbishment and the replacement of its already very large stock of capacity. Second biggest region uh, after China in terms of investment is India. It's accounting for about 18% of total investment spent to mainly build up its capacity as production levels are incre will be increasing, as Peter pointed out in the previous slides. Globally, the cumulative total investment from now until 2050 in the baseline scenario is estimated at roughly 1,150 billion US dollars. Focusing now on the sustainable development scenario, cumulative investment increases by about 20% compared to the baseline scenario I just mentioned, and reflects the fact that the cumulative steel demand is roughly 10% lower in the sustainable development scenario compared to our baseline scenario. Hence, as a result, uh, there will be lower total investment in steel production capacity, and that will be required. However, the type of steel production capacity capacities will be different. In detail, so the SDS, iron and steel making portfolio, requires around 35% cumulative investment in technologies that are currently in demonstration or prototype phases, which are of most of the time higher cost, especially when we are comparing it to the baseline scenario where the included technologies are all made, all already mature today. Focusing on the estimated investment in steel production per ton, we can observe a reducing trend in the baseline scenario. Such phenomena due to the increasing share of secondary production as steel production from scrap is, is considerably, this is, so, is considerably less capital in intensive. On the other hand, uh, when we look at uh, the same graph but per the, uh, the impact of SDS, we can see that investment in steel production per ton grows over time, representing the fact that in the investments into technologies currently in their early stages of development occur much later in the modeling horizon once the basically the technologies have become commercially available. Therefore, the differences in the scenarios is the greatest in the 
2041 to 2050 time period, roughly being 60% higher in the than in the baseline scenario. So with this, um, I would like to I would like to pass my I'm just thinking I'll pass to Asa if uh, there are any additional questions or clarifying questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Hannah. Um, well, I've got one question, and that is, how does the clean energy investment required for the steel, uh, for steel production, compare to that required for the general societal transformation, so including industry and transport and building and so on? Yes, um, I guess I, for, for this question, I might be um, able to pass to one of my colleagues, which have been more uh, involved in this sort of analysis. So, just on, on that question, I don't have the exact figure in hand, but we, we present the total system analysis investment. Uh, so, can you can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're a little bit muffled. Can you? Oh, sorry. sorry. So. Yeah, so we, we do present the entire the energy system um, uh, investments required in the sustainable development scenario in our ETP 2020 analysis. So this would be the place to go to consult for, for that kind of global cumulative figure for, for energy system investment. And then these uh, investments presented in this technology roadmap are compatible with the boundaries used in that in that broader energy system publication. So from there, you'll be able to get an idea of the proportion um, that's faced by the steel sector relative to other sectors of the energy system. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, there are no more questions, in fact, so we can move on to the next session. All right, so as we've shown, the sustainable transition for the iron and steel sector will require a massive technology transformation. And so in this final section, we will look at the roles of various actors and key enabling mechanisms required to realize the changes envisioned in the sustainable development scenario. Now, just to note that we have included in the roadmap a dedicated chapter on this topic, and while we're unable to prescribe specific actions for every re regional circumstance or circumstance, we cover in detail the current policy landscape and the menu of options available to accelerate progress in this area. And so not surprisingly, there's no one quick fix policy or solution for the steel sector. Rather, coordinated efforts on multiple fronts across a diverse range of stakeholders are required. And so this includes governments and steel producers in the leading role and also with valuable contributions from other stakeholders, including steel users, financial institutions, other industries, technology suppliers, trade unions, researchers, and non-governmental organizations. The overarching driver of change lies in setting long-term plans and establishing a clear, reliable policy signal for emission reductions. Here, governments will play a key role by formulating transition plans and roadmaps and adopting long-term emission reduction policies, such as, for example, carbon pricing or industry CO2 performance standards. Additionally, targeted efforts are needed for specific technology categories, including emission-intensive technologies that will still be required for some years to come and clean technologies that are at varying stages of development today. Steel producers will need to make careful plans for their existing assets and the timing for the rollout of new lower emission technologies. This includes planning for the likelihood that any plants built in the short term with high emitting technologies would likely later need to be adapted or retrofitted to use low emission fuels or technologies like CCS when those become available. Governments can also help through retrofit ready requirements and sunset clauses for high emitting technologies. Furthermore, governments have an important role in market creation for near zero emission steel. A key policy that could help with this is carbon contracts for difference, which would cover the additional cost of low emission primary production relative to conventional production. 
Other options may include public procurement or minimum content regulations. Governments can also help with financing for riskier first-of-a-kind plans through concessional and low-interest loans. Intermediate steel users can also help by setting up purchase agreements for near-zero emission steel. Now, as we've shown, innovation is still needed on technologies that are not yet market ready. And so in this realm, the efforts of steel producers to pilot and demonstrate these technologies are critical. As well, government financial support is needed for these R&D efforts. A focus on material efficiency can help increase scrap available for secondary production and reduce the need for new steel. Efforts from actors all along these value chains, from design to end of life, will be important to using steel more efficiently. Governments can support these efforts through modified design regulations that consider full life cycle emissions and promote longer lifetimes where advantageous, and through setting up improved scrap collection and sorting channels. Finally, enabling conditions need to be put in place to support the technology transformation. Ensuring a level playing field for steel companies around the world will be vital. This area is tricky and there's no easy solution. While the universal carbon price or a global sectoral agreement could be highly efficient options, these are not likely to be achieved in the near term. Therefore, other options may need to be considered for regions looking to raise ambition, such as special provisions in emission reduction policies that help with industry competitiveness without in undermining policy ambition, or options like carbon border adjustments or consumption-based emission reduction policies. These also come with challenges that would need addressing through careful policy designed to ensure compliance with international trade law and to develop rigorous CO2 content tracking schemes. International cooperation in other areas will also be important, such as technology transfer, best practice sharing, and international finance. As noted, many of the near zero emission steelmaking technologies require supporting infrastructure, such as CO2 transport and storage for CCUS based routes, and near zero, zero emission electricity generation and hydrogen production for hydrogen based routes. Since this infrastructure likely won't be used by one steel company alone, but rather multiple users, government planning and support will be needed. It is also important to start this planning early so the infrastructure will be ready for when near zero emission steel making technologies reach the market. The importance of improved data collection, tracking and reporting should also not be overlooked. This will be invaluable for tracking progress and for differentiating near zero emission steel production for policy and purchasing purposes. Steel producers can help through reporting emissions to data collection schemes and by helping develop near zero emission production certification methods. Financial institutions can also improve the information they provide to their investors by developing sustainable finance classifications and schemes. Now time is of the essence and we are only now one or two investment cycles away from a target of drastically lower CO2 emissions for the steel sector. But the transition cannot happen overnight, which is why the next 10 years from now to 2030 is a critical window to lay the groundwork needed for long-term success. During this period, it will be important to capitalize on near-term opportunities for material efficiency and technology performance improvements, and with an eye to the longer term, demonstrate near zero emission technologies and develop the necessary supporting infrastructure. The changes ahead will surely not be easy, but with strong cooperation and sustained efforts from stakeholders, such as many of the people attending this webinar today, the steel sector is well placed to be a leader in the clean energy transition. I'll now pass back to Araceli to conclude. Thanks very much, Tiffany. Um, yeah, just, just very quick points uh, from my side, a bit to wrap up on the key areas that have been discussed and then uh, with no more delay we can go more to uh, respond in the different questions. Um, just again to highlight uh, some of our key messages here. So reinforcing again that steel is fundamental to our societies. We've seen in the presentation how uh, steel has been uh, part of many different, uh, let's say, development in many different sectors uh, in the past. And also moving forward when we look at clean energy transitions uh, there's uh, particular areas where it would become even more important. Uh, so, indeed, uh, tackling emissions from the iron steel sector is something that we have to take uh, to take part as an integral, in an integral way of the uh, strategies moving forward. Uh, to do this, we've looked into different uh, strategies, of course, starting by 
uh, making a more use of, of energy, uh, more e efficient use of energy, sorry, but also of materials. Uh, and that would include as well uh, recycling. Um, there's a lot of uh, good progress and uh, a good, let's say, context to build on uh, in the Austin sector. We've still been one of the commodities that, that is uh, more highly recycled uh, today already. So that's a, a group of strategies that uh, we could build upon uh, really uh, moving forward and the good half, as you have seen in our uh, clean energy transition in the sector, uh, a good uh, and important contribution in the short term as well. Moving forward and to reach really the, uh, let's say, more resilient uh, emissions uh, remaining in the sector and to reach really uh, deeper uh, emission reductions to contribute to net zero emissions uh, at the system level. Again, new uh, uh, innovative near zero or zero emission technologies will be needed. Uh, different strategies, a portfolio and a good menu of options are being uh, developed. And so uh, there's uh, again a good momentum and uh, context for the sector uh, to build on this and to push forward in uh, making those technologies available at commercial scale. To, to start kind of benefiting from their uh, from their uh, footprints, but of course uh, doing that would require as well uh, uh, developments on enabling infrastructure. Uh, we saw examples on uh, particularly for hydrogen, but also um, carbon capture uh, for storage and use, which uh, would require important efforts and collaborative efforts from different uh, stakeholders and good coordination. And uh, this is where uh, it comes really the the uh, need uh, for a more uh, coordination and uh, boost, uh, boosted efforts from governments working together with the industry to make sure that we could uh, put all the tools needed in place uh, to uh, speed up this, uh, this transition. As Tiffany was just highlighting in the last uh, uh, component of the, of the presentation, more focusing on, on policy and regulation, and the first uh, starting point here, of course, uh, and which is fundamental is for governments to provide visibility uh, on uh, the signals that uh, would uh, really be pushing for emission reductions in the long term. Uh, but that visibility needs to start now with clear and stable, um, let's say, uh, uh, signals that could uh, reinforce investments from uh, not just from governments, but also leveraging on the, uh, the capacity from the private sector to, to get on board on this. Um, there's particular areas where government is uh, fundamental uh, beyond this, uh, particularly on coordinating infrastructure development, uh, coordinating as well, uh, labeling standards, etc. And of course, ensuring a level playing field, uh, which is of particular uh, criticality, if we want to say so, uh, for the Amsterdam sector, given uh, its high exposure to, to trade. And just to conclude uh, with the message of urgency in the sense that uh, really next decade is critical a period to change the course of uh, the emissions trajectory is not just on this sector but in others as well and so um, we hope that uh, this type of work uh, sectoral roadmaps and collaboration with industries uh, discussions with governments as well uh, would uh, really uh, contribute uh, to to this endeavor uh, overall so with this i will just uh, close it here uh, pass the floor back to asa so we can uh, address questions from the other different participants. Thank you very much.